Hello, everyone. Welcome to Music Scene Investigation. Rich Wildman here. Janae Giddens out in the chat room joining us. Glad to see you, Janae. If you want to join us in the chat room, please do. MusicScenInvestigation.com is where you can find all that cool stuff at. And we're glad you joined us today. Going to be a very good show today. I remember to turn my light on. I pushed all the right buttons. You can't ask for more than that, so we're going to let you go. Have a great weekend. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> kidding. <of course. laughs> I'm kidding. I usually mess this part up, and I'm doing so well so far, I thought I'd make a joke, but it failed miserably. That now, just jinxed it. It did. It really did, <laughs> and that's what I do, apparently. Uh, glad to have you on with us today. Uh, I want to uh, take the time and let you know that if you're a fan of indie music, you're going to hear uh, music that you probably have never heard before on the broadcast right here. What we do is we take three songs that are submitted by indie musicians from around the world, and we put them in front of our panel in the MSI Labs, and we let that panel kind of pick them apart in some cases. They praise them if they're good. They uh, tell you if they're not, as well as uh, indie music bus and Walt, the guy who drives it, likes to say, these are reviews you can use, and if you're an indie artist, we certainly hope you take that to heart. Submit your music at musicsceneinvestigation.com. And uh, right now, I'm going to introduce you to our in-house panelist on today's broadcast, all the way from New York City, Mr. Tom Chianti. Tom, how are you, sir? Welcome to the show again. Again, I am here. You keep trying to fool with me by playing the show at the same time thinking that I'm going to double think that this time you're not going to show the show at the same time and not be here. I know it's it's the way I do things is uh you know I try and use that reverse psychology on you. But I you know I am always here forever. I never sleep ever because I am Batman. <laughs> Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> and um Oh, yesterday on Unscripted Audio, four hours, live mix. Wow. Broadcasting four hours and talking about a mix. I went hoarse halfway through, but it was a great show. The interview went great. Had a lot of people show up. It was a lot of fun. Um, you can catch it on justin.tv slash Alonatomic. It's all labeled. Lots of parts, lots of shows, lots of fun. Well, I'm glad that that went well. I was a little worried about that because I know four hours is a long time. For anyone to broadcast well it, it just got a little you know handling the the well you do it so well you make it seem effortlessly switching between cameras and 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 making sure that everybody's levels are okay and and you know nobody knows that behind the scenes to to make this look as, as good or as bad as it does depending upon your opinion these is it's a lot of tech and you got to run a bunch of programs and stuff so I'm running a bunch of programs all on one computer, plus the desk uh, presenter program, plus the uh, digital performance door, and and then I'm trying to discuss how I'm using the plugins and describe what the busing is and all this tech talk and tech work and no wonder why I'm graying and bald. And you're tired. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, a little weary. I'm surprised, but you know, as old guys, we we bounce back. You know, the the good thing about it is, Tom, you have the next hour or so to catch up on your afternoon nap, like you normally do. This is true, and well, no, <laughs> not today. I, I think we have a, a very interesting new friend with us, so I, I I may stay for half the show and fall asleep during um during the, husband's during parts. the review parts, right? Yeah. Well, no, I just don't listen to the music. I oh. make it up. All right. Well, that that's fair enough. Fair enough. And speaking of the uh, the uh, Ian Husbands parts, let's Sorry. meet him as well, Mister Ian Husbands from London, England. Ian, how you doing, man? I'm good. I hear you didn't go horse through the show, Tom, but I heard there was a lot of naysaying. Oh, badumpa. Oh, badumpa. How we doing? There was there was a little squealing like a pig, <laughs> and with a banjo. <laughs> that was the song I, I, I was mixing. <laughs> I don't know. How are things going over in London, England? Ian? Well, the winter's slowly setting in. We had a quite a nice day today, but um, it's getting cold now. So uh, I've been out at kids' birthdays and weddings and friends' coffees and all sorts of things over the weekend, so it's been a busy one. But here I am with a new T-shirt in honour of our guest. And what does this shirt say? It's a little bit difficult for me to read. It's, it's Angry Birds Star Wars. It's Pork Vader. 
and it says come to the dark side all right well fair <laughs> enough i don't play angry birds anymore i found it was too uh addicting for me yeah i i, I nearly missed the show tonight because i was trying to complete one level on star wars angry birds 2 yeah i'm i'm an addictive personality and that wouldn't do me at all well, i wouldn't say you're addictive at all personally but yeah well it is what it is. You have some <laughs> statistics for us, Ian. I know you do. Uh, you, you generally keep track of those things. Last week on the broadcast, everybody, we had three songs we went through and listened to. Uh, Chris Chandler, with his track Friends, was selected Song of the Week by our panelists. Uh, along with that song, uh, you heard a group called Sanctioned to Life with their track Wall of Pain and Zach Caruso with his track I Am David. How did the witness statements turn out this time around, Ian? Well, it was a quiet week again, but those who did vote agreed with us 100% of the way. Songwriting, performance, and mix and production, uh, everyone went for Chris Chandler and friends. So glad to see they're on our side still. Well, that's good to hear. I'm always happy when, uh, when we hear that everybody agrees with the panelists. It's a rare event anymore. So. It is. Well, no, it's, it's, we've been all right the past few weeks, but we did have a bit of a, a spate when no one agreed with us. Yeah, well, well, we don't usually agree with ourselves. That, that, that's, <laughs> you know, more true than not, believe it or not. And uh, let me take the opportunity to introduce everyone to our guest panelists. By the way, Ian, thank you for being here. And as always, that's all right. I want to introduce our guest panelist. However, our guest panelist today is a. Uh, Songwriter, producer, mixer, engineer, and actor. This guy has a resume longer than I am tall. And that is saying quite a lot because I'm super huge. I'm 10 foot tall and bulletproof. These <coughs> jokes just aren't working out, are they? That's okay. Our guest panelist is Ian Blackwood from Toronto, Canada. And uh, Ian has had the opportunity to work with some very, very major award-winning Canadian producers as well as American producers. He's a musician, he's played in a number of bands. We'll talk about those with him as well. We'll also talk a little bit, maybe, if I can get him to talk about it, about his acting stint on Canadian and U.S. television. Please welcome Mr. Ian Blackwood, everyone. Ian, welcome to the broadcast. Glad to have you with us. Thanks for having me, guys. So, uh... Let me ask you a little bit uh, about what it is that you do. I, I can see you're sitting in a studio right now. I'm assuming uh, this is the famed Lime Green studio that uh, that you have on your website and that you run. Yeah, this is the place. Um, this is the second half. I, you know, as being an actor and a musician, it's great because. Um, Nothing better than being able to compose your own music in your own place because uh, it's free. <laughs> there is and, that. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of great, uh, a lot of great music has come out of here, and um, yeah, I'm still kind of, um, you know, working it in and have an artist in. You know, I just I finished up with three artists this week, so been pretty busy. You know? Now, uh, according to your bio here that I'm, uh, I have in front of me, you've had the opportunity to work with some, some very interesting, uh, producers and, and engineers, including, uh, Greg Norrie, uh, Gavin Brown, just to name a couple. Um, w let me ask you, when you work with a producer as a producer yourself, um, how do you reconcile those egos that sometimes get brought into the room? You know, because everybody, I, you know, everybody has them. Now, I'm not trying to put you in a corner here, but how do you reconcile? How do you find a way to work together? I mean, everybody's got different ideas about the way something should sound, something should be put together and so forth. Yeah, you just get really drunk and <laughs> you just let, you know, you let the fists fly and who knows what happens next. Um, no, for me, it's not that hard, man, because I'm... I'm the kind of person that loves to learn and I believe that we are always learning as artists as like cheesy and kind of cliche as that sounds. Guys like Gavin Brown, guys like Greg Norrie, these are, these are, these are monster guys that have made massive records that have sold, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of copies. And when guys like that speak, you kind of put down the producer card and you just sort of listen, you know, like for me, that's, that was my experience. I'm not about to 
disagree with, you know, felt like Greg Nori responsible for bands like Sum 41 and, you know, like uh, Mariana's Trench, these Canadian artists that, and, you know, Sum 41 who crossed into the States and sold millions. Um, Gavin Brown, Metric, you know, uh, Billy Talent. Like, it's, it's, when those guys talk, it's just, okay, cool. Like, I'm humble. Like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not, I'm not really gonna say too much other than, like, how did you do this or how'd you do that? Because I want to learn. <laughs> So. Now, I know that uh, you're also a musician as well, and uh, you've had uh, quite a bit of success, you know, from some of the stuff you've been doing on YouTube, from some of the other stuff you've been doing as well. How do you uh, put all that together? I know that uh, being a producer, being a musician kind of goes hand in hand sometimes, um, but which part of that is, uh, I, I really hate to paint you in a, a circle here, but which part of that is the most fun. What do you enjoy doing the most? Being the musician, being the producer, the acting, which, which out of those? Uh, yeah, I honestly, it's like, <laughs> it depends on the day, really. Like, it depends on the mood. Um, I love writing songs. I mean, sometimes I hate writing songs, but for like 98% of the time, I like writing songs. Um, producing music is a lot of fun. Gosh, I don't know. It's hard, man. Like, um, acting is like super fun because you know you get paid a lot of money to do it and <laughs> you don't get paid a lot of money in the in, in the music industry sometimes sometimes you, you hit it and it's great but with with acting it's a lot more consistent although the the jobs are hard to get um but i mean music has always been my like 110 percent. like when i'm when i'm playing a show you know there's no preconceived notions of what i'm doing it's i'm playing a show and this is me and you know like i i, I I have a tendency to break things when I play. I throw my guitars all the time. You can ask my friend Zach. He's one of the guitar techs in Walk Off the Earth. When I'm playing in my bands, I get him to tech for me. And seven times at its end, he can vouch for it that I've I've smashed you know a guitar every three shows, and he's had to clean it up. So um, <laughs> it's it's a difficult question, just because I love being an artist in general. And um, yeah, I mean, I love contributing music into film as well. I like I like sort of all aspects of it, and trying to get in my hands and everywhere. Do you really find Filth, that, so filthy. Sort of, as a producer, songwriter, engineer, actor, it you know really you, you just sort of scrap them titles and you are now just an artist? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I think that's the best way to say it. Um, I mean, that way I can get away with wearing skin tight pants and not, no, I just say I'm an artist. <laughs> you know, I'm just. Uh... <laughs> but as a producer, Ian, how often do you find yourself posing the question? I don't know. What do you think? Um, that depends on the situation. Usually, it that's a good that is a good question, Tom. I find that like if I'm working with an artist that's confident in where they're going in the direction of their songs or in their music, which is it's kind of a seventy thirty in favor of the artists I work with are usually pretty confident in the sort of the construction of their music. So I find in those artists, yes, like. I'll, I'll turn over like and kind of say, um, you know, like what? Yeah, what do you think? And um, but if it's the other thirty percent where I'm working with, say, slightly younger artists that have come to me for some advice, it's usually my way or the highway. Now I see in your bio that you work with a number of bands. I want to touch on that a bit. You've worked with uh, bands like Jersey, The Full Blast, uh, Walk Off the Earth, to name a few. But you've also got a a new project you're working on a. Uh, Ian Blackwood and the Bipolars. What, what can you tell me about that? Tell me about what you're up to uh, uh, in your music. I can tell you right now that I'm not wearing my own band shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and you cannot order them next week on Facebook.com slash the Ian Blackwood. Um, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> the new music. I actually sent a bit of it to Ian just to give him a little taste of what's going on. It's got, um, I've been a massive slide guitar, like older, like Johnny Cash on a country rock, um, fan for a long, long time. D well into my, like, um, late teens, early twenties, punk rock years. I always wanted to find a way to incorporate that, um, sort of western slide guitar deserty lo-fi quality um music into sort of pop rock and um uh, ian blackwood and the bipolars is really based around that and based around like just the emotion that those types of instruments bring um 
you know, the really sort of rootsy acoustic uh, dobros and um, there's still electric guitar and some drum work in it, but it's more so it's focused on like, imagine a drum kit that's like the size of a house, you know, (laughs) it's just big, big sounds, deserts and cowboys and guns and I don't know. Yeah. So ninjas. Sorry, Tom. Ninjas. (laughs) And and just ninjas all over the place, all all over, all over it. I, I, you... I, have, I have to say, having heard some of this stuff, and I won't give too much away, but it sounds fantastic. Thanks, Ian. Uh, I was just going to say, sometimes Tom brings up ninjas because he used to be one. And, oh. uh, well, it was either that or a Navy walrus. I'm not exactly sure, but I think they both wear the same pajamas. Now, um, <laughs> let me ask you a question about uh, promotion, because I know that uh, music promotion today has changed from what it was, say, uh, 15 years ago with the advent of social media with uh, tools like YouTube, Vimeo, um, and and Facebook even uh, from a social media perspective. Uh, promotion has, has changed uh, like almost 180 degrees around, especially for the indie musician. What would be your advice to uh, new indie musicians, new artists uh, that are wanting to aspire to greatness uh, to to be success, successful in the industry, what would be your advice to them in the way of promotion these days? Write a good song. Simple. Straightforward. Well, well I just... You know, you know uh, how many Facebook likes do you have? Who gives you... Who, who care? Can I swear? I don't know if I can yep, swear. <laughs> you can. I mean, we like to keep it family-friendly, so... Yes. Okay, so I won't. Um, I, I find that, like... You know, how many Facebook likes do you got? How many Twitter followers do you have? These things can be just be, they can be manipulated and you can buy them. And then when you buy them, it's like, what does that even mean? And I understand that people look at it like, oh, the greater the numbers, the more popular you are. But I'm telling you, I've seen some of the greatest singer songwriters that have, don't even have Facebook and, and they just write great music and f- forever no one will know who they are because they just, it's unfortunate because it's those types of people that do write the good song, then you want them to say, okay, now, you know, get out there, get that on social media, get a Twitter, start, you know, nagging people and annoying them, not too much, but enough. So, um, so, so is it then not the responsibility, uh, or I, I don't want to say not the responsibility of an artist, uh, because obviously if an artist wants to be successful, they bear some responsibility on their own promotion, but should they then, if they're... Uh, uh, don't have Facebook or something like that, uh, look into bringing in promoters, bringing in management, things like that. Yeah, um, to, to keep it so light, I didn't mean to keep it so lightly with just write a good song. I mean, that's obviously, <laughs> a, I'm just, I, I, there's just so much, there's so much music now. I mean, there's always been music, but there's so much now. You guys know this, and there's so many ways of making it. And this, as soon as GarageBand came out, which I think is still a stellar program, but programs like this came out, it, that everyone became a musician, and then everyone just decided they had the right to do whatever they wanted, and I still think that that's not true. I mean, well, you, you have the right to do what you want and express yourself, but I don't know that it's just like, you should, not every single person on the planet should be recording music if they're not good at it. Like, I'm not going to build a house. I don't know how to build a house. I'm going to hire a guy to build a house because I want a good house. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, so with promotions, it, it, yes, absolutely. I think playing shows... If you're a brand new band, play shows. Play a hundred shows. Get out there. Get tight as a band. Communicate. Start the camaraderie. You know, um, bounce off each other. Become a band. Watch your live videos. Watch it like football players. Watch their plays. Like, um, get good at being a really tight, awesome live band. Then once you've gotten that down and you've got a great song, great live band, great recording, um, there's a lot of online management and online, online promotions you can hire. Look into them. Do your research. There's, you know, here in Canada, there's tons of them. Um, and you, uh, globally, they're all over the place. So, but do your research first. Ask some friends. But yes, I think online promotion is very important. But a song is first. All right. Well, that makes sense. And speaking of songs being first. Before, before, before we sure, move Ian. on, I just want to put one question to Ian. All right. Ian, your family. We, we touched on this before the show extensive amount of musicians you got sarah in walk off the earth and the creep show your sister jen was also in the creep show you're doing what you're doing you've got a cousin who sings as well i believe yes what do i feed um, you <laughs> 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 you know, why why you know you, you, your dad taught you guitar right 
Yeah, well, my dad started like when I was 11, you know, he always had there was there's musical instruments all through the house. There's an old upright piano that was half tuned. Um, there was acoustic guitars all over the place. Never an electric guitar though. There was never an electric. I introduced that. I was the I was the lucky one. Um, but my yeah, my father introduced me to it. I saw an acoustic lying. Uh, you know, I, when I was old enough to realize what it was and what it did, he said to me, "Oh, you want to try playing that?" I picked it up. He showed me a C chord, and then he gave me the book of chords. And he said, "You know, I'll tell you what. You learn those book of chords in a month, and then maybe we'll get you your own guitar." So um, after a month or two, unfortunately. You could be being a family of three kids, and uh, my dad was the only one who worked. They didn't really have the money, so unfortunately, the "we'll get you your own guitar" didn't really happen yet. Um, until the following Christmas, when I was uh, twelve, my dad got me uh, a beautiful white acoustic guitar or uh, electric guitar, which I can show you guys after. Um, you know, in between, and uh, he got it for me, and um, it was the greatest thing I ever bought, or the greatest thing I ever received as a present. And then I went and took lessons for three months, learned the blues, which still to this day is relevant in all my music. Because I think it's the greatest, um, you know, the blue scales, pentatonic scales are the easiest when you're soloing. You can just use them throughout. So, um, what do they feed us? Well, I mean, there is a lake, Lake Ontario. It's pretty polluted. And I don't know, maybe that did something to all of us. But uh. So, so you're, you're a musical superhero in disguise from the polluted fish. <laughs> exactly. So are you by a nuclear power plant or something? Well, we're actually by Hamilton Bay, and Hamilton Bay is um, not too uh, dislike um, the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, which I'm sure you guys are familiar, maybe not Ian so much, but um, it's pretty, Hamilton Bay is, it's, they call it Steel City, and it's got all the steel mills, and they pour into the bay, and it's, it's pretty much the most polluted, one of the most polluted places in Canada, I think, pretty sure, um, but Hamilton's actually a really nice city, it's really bad, they get a bad rap, but. They're probably going to hate me for saying that. Probably shouldn't have said that. But well, I got a letter right here. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. No one from no one from there watches the show anyway. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. Now, I do want to get to some music today because we do have uh, three selections to go through. So if we can do that, uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Um, please put your headphones on. Let's take a listen to today's first selection on Music Scene Investigation. This is... Song number one on today's MSI. Hope you enjoyed, everyone. The first thought I had was you. Then I remembered that you had gone. I didn't know what to do. Lying on the floor in my house of one. I shouldn't even care. I shouldn't need you to feel complete There's people everywhere The world is full, but my days are so empty The house is still, but I'm trembling gently And I am living alone, the time has erased And just like my journal I thought maybe you'd come home I let that thought carry me on I got up and ran to the door Somehow convinced that you would be there And I let that hope soar This time would be different this time
And there we have song number one on today's music scene investigation. And I want to find out what our panelists thought of it. So we'll go over to Mr. Ian Husbands first. Ian, your thoughts on track number one. All right. Uh, let's do that intro to start with. Sorry, there wasn't an intro to deal with. Um, that was pretty much all in, and that took me off guard. Um, I think that was too much for this track. You know, sometimes all in works. With the way this is currently recorded and sitting, it, it didn't work. Um, I think there was even a bit missing at the start. It almost sounded like it sort of clipped in. Um, but saying that, there's a lot of mix issues on this. But I like the song. There's some really clever lyrics going on here. Things like, um, just like my journal, I'm all empty pages. I really like that little hook. That really worked for me. Um, vocals, you know, he's got a good idea of what he's doing. I like his performance. Uh, I like the backing vocal arrangement as well. Nice to hear a track some backing vocals. We haven't had many of them in the past few weeks. Um, but let's get back to this mix. Um, the mix is all over the place. And uh, to start with, the vocals aren't present enough. Uh, the lead vocal especially. The backing vocals weren't too bad. But that lead vocal needs to come up and sit above everything. Because currently it's being swamped by that acoustic, which was too loud and a bit too jangly on the top end for my liking. Um, that needed to be a bit trimmed, just slightly warmer on the top end. Um, was it a piano in there? Did I hear a piano in there or was it a stringed instrument? I really couldn't make it out because it was so muddied up in everything else. But there was some nice sort of playing some nice little arpeggios and stuff in there and uh, that was kind of lost. You heard it when the vocals weren't there but it was minimal. So that needs to be brought out. More space in this mix. Um, you know, it would benefit a lot from some percussion or even a full drum kit. Um, it would benefit a lot from, I think there was a bass in there, but again, it was just so muddied up, I couldn't tell the instruments apart from each other too much. There was a lot of bottom end on the acoustic guitar, which was muddying anything bassy, anything else bassy up because it was so loud in the mix. Um, so, yeah, I mean, really, the, the biggest thing for me was the mix. I like the arrangement. I like the songwriting. I like the performance of the guy's vocal, but the rest of it needs a lot of attention. All right. Well, I appreciate your thoughts, Ian. Thank you very much. Now let's head over to Mr. Tom Chianti. Tom, what do you think about track number one? I uh, agree a lot with what Ian had said. It's very crowded, uh, very uh, smeared is the word, and I, and I think that comes from um, using all the same reverb, not using different reverbs for backgrounds and instruments and lead vocals. Um, I, I agree with him also. It's a very interesting song. It's a, I think it has a strong song and a strong hook. Um, I don't think there was a bass. I would have loved to have heard like some bass violas, cellos or something, doing staccato bass in there, uh, playing along, just to, to, to hold and anchor the bottom end. The uh, guitars being a little jangly, the only reason why that bothered me, there was no balance. And, and the balance isn't overall in the mixes were um, a little out of place. You know, if there was that jangly guitar, there should be something a little bit low-endy to, to anchor it so it doesn't sort of seem so out of place. But uh, in a nice stereo separation, I checked it in mono, nothing was phasing too badly. Uh, nothing disappeared in mono. Um, again, nice vocalist, good singing, good song. And uh, the mix really, you know... Um, most of everything they need is there already. Um, maybe some percussion, but I get the vibe they're going for. The, the folky, you know, wall of acoustic guitars and, and, and vocals. Um, very Paul Simon, um, Simon Garfunkel. Um, nice sound. But again, you've got to use more than one reverb. You've got to trim the bottom end off the of sounds that don't need it. You've got to make the vocal more... Uh, present, a uh, lot more clarity in it to hear the pronunciation. You were losing a lot of words at the beginning of the consonants. Uh, the background vocals were just too crowded. That string section that came in was a little overpowering. The start, um, it didn't bother me too much. I think that they could have, I think it was clipped, which is why it was such a jarring start. But overall, strong song. All right. Thank you very much, Tom. Now over to Mr. Ian Blackwood. Ian, tell me what you think of track number one. It's, uh, you know, I, I 
interesting. Tom just said that. I have a feeling it these days. Do people not know about the high pass filter? Like, <laughs> that's a good question. It's just, um, yeah. This this mix was to me it was a mess. It was like just saturated and soaking wet and really like sounded so like synthy eighties, which could be really cool. But right now, people who are doing their synthy eighties, it's still it's still pretty dry. It's it's reverb where it needs to be and it's high end where it needs to be. Um, for me, I, I made a couple notes. I thought um, I just got to pull them up. Um, I really I, I agree with Ian. I uh, just like my journal, all empty pages. I thought that lyric was fantastic. So that caught me of saying um, I would love to hear like maybe a, a chorus. I, I guess it was sort of the chorus hook line or one of the lines. I would have probably used it more as a chorus and sort of focused on that as songwriting. Um, I thought the length was great. I love that it was like three minutes. That's awesome. Like people writing songs that are five minutes plus these days. It's you know, it's kind of frustrating, and I don't understand why they're doing it unless, you know, unless you're um, Black Sabbath, you know, they can do it because, you know, they're Black Sabbath. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I noticed that the synths were just, like, super heavy, too. Um, I think this band could benefit by, you know, maybe just sort of approaching it, again, or a little more organically, um, like you, even like Tom and Ian were both saying. I thought... Um, even like a stand-up bass would have been cool in there. Like Tom was saying, some sort of staccato bass or like maybe even a sort of a stand-up bass. Lose a lot of the reverb and 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 strip it down and make it um, a little bit more folky, organic. Because that guy's voice is super cool too. It had that kind of um, geek nerd rock vibe to it. There was even kind of like bare naked ladies vibe to it, like in in yeah. a in a strange folky way. I thought. Um, but Paul Simon though, that that definitely hits the the nail on the head. Um, but yeah, I thought the it was just too wet uh, that that mix. I think that was the thing that that scared me the most of the song because there was a lot of greatness hiding because of the the poor mix. All right. Well, I appreciate that, Ian. Thank you very much. Let me introduce that track to everybody. The name of that track is "Empty Pages" by Great Highway. We appreciate Great Highway sending that track into Music Scene Investigation. If you'd like to have your song in front of the panel, it's easy to do. Go to musicsceneinvestigation.com. At the top of the page, you'll see a link for Submit a Song. Follow the information on that page, and you're in. Every week, we'll select three new selections randomly to go in front of the panel. All right, guys, uh, we've got two more tracks to listen to. Track number two is up next. I put it to you. This is track number two on today's MSI. When you woke up this morning Tell me how did you feel Do you like what you're seeing When you look in the mirror Was it worth all the trouble Are you afraid to come home Yeah, we built it together Hope you like it alone Cause it's done, it's done, it's done It's done, I'm done It's not alright, I'm not okay
That's track number two on today's music scene investigation. We're going to go over and find out what Mr. Tom Chianti thought first. So over to you, Tom. Let me hear it. Okay. Uh, first off, I think this is a really, really good demo. Um, it, it, it's put together very well. The parts change and, and, and the drive changes. There's build, tension, release. On the downside, in the intro, that backward sound is not really necessary. Um, the acoustic sound is good, and that just really got in the way and was distracting. Um, let's see. They've got stereo bus compression, I think, going on, because in the, in the middle eight, when it went into that breakdown, the drums sort of disappeared as the big, big over-affected guitars came in and really pushed uh, the, the bus. Uh, the drums just all of a sudden got small. And then they came back. Good vocal performance. Uh, I like all the parts. I'm not a big fan of the snare sound, but that's just a personal thing. Um, those big guitars in the, um, in the chorus, I like the idea of them, but uh, they just seem so overly affected that they, they overshadow everything. And, and it, 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 it gave me the impression of like a, like a hawk with these big wings coming out, which is cool, but the wings wound up being bigger than the body, and uh, that's not cool. Um, nice bottom. It, 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 it's a very good demo mix. It, it just needs, um, I think everything is there. The performance-wise and everything, and nice parts. I think they just take this back to the board and uh, rethink it a little drier on some things, uh, bring the vocal up a little bit, nice use of backgrounds and doubling. Um, yeah, very, very strong demo. All right, Tom, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Over to Mr. Ian Blackwood. Ian, what do you think of track number two? I actually love the reverse guitar and then the modern drum drop and stuff. Not the bus compression that Tom was mentioning, but that's just a personal sort of opinion in that. Like, I feel like these guys are going for a modern vibe just with music, kind of like listening to that kind of pop punk, pop stuff, pop rock. They're doing that a lot now with some reverse guitar effects and stuff. I, I really dug the intro. This guy's voice is amazing. Um, super strong. There was like two moments where I was like, oh, just a little bit overtuned. They kind of like maybe touched that up. But that's, again, I'm being super picky because I actually thought this was really good. I re actually really dug this song too. Maybe this is war. Like, I like that stuff. I like that sort of um, uh, you, the battle of the, of the sexes or what have you. The battle of, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, boyfriend, boyfriend, girlfriend, girlfriend, what have you. I, I, I love that kind of stuff. Tells a good story. Um, yeah, I didn't... I, I, I do agree with Tom on some, some small things about being a demo, a demo mix, because I actually kind of wish there was a little bit more room to the drums, like a room mic that was like compressed and maybe a little bit like just oomphier, because it sounded like, like close spot miking on the drums, which is cool and it's to totally effective for demos. But, um, oh, I mean, it's, a, it's close, though. It sounded really close for me. I, I, I really dug it. And then in that bridge with that cool circus vibe, the piano... Um, they, they pick some good tones, man. Like, I, yeah, I, I thought this was a good cut. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ian. And now over to the other Ian. Find out what he thinks. Ian, what do you think? 
Oh, I, I, yeah. It's a great song. I love it. I mean, I haven't got much to say about it from the point of view of it. It's very well done. Um, everything's sitting there. I like the little use of the, the xylophone and that coming in under that piano as well. Um, on that mid late, on that mid late, I did lose the vocal a little bit at this end. Um, that was one of my biggest criticisms. Is like the rest of the vocals were really well mixed. When that mid late kicked in, it all sort of dropped down. The vocal was sort of lost. I couldn't quite make the clarity out. Love the hook, <clears throat> the this is war thing. I think uh, currently, you know, yes, it's a song about the battle of the sexes, but you know, war is very sort of uh, in people's minds with global exploits at the moment. And uh, you know, when you're writing songs like this, thinking about that sort of thing and hooking into people's mentality is a great thing. So I think this would go down really well at the moment. Had a sort of Rob Thomas feel to me, Matchbox Twenty. Uh, I think if they had this on one of their albums, it would be a hit. Um, so it really is just a case of getting this out there. Uh, again, the reverse acoustic guitar, the little um, sort of tape slide in there. Um, ear candy, it's it's being done to keep it modern. Um, and, you know, I didn't mind it. It wasn't offensive. Um, it worked for me. It wasn't really that big from the point of view. You know, I had to listen. Oh, yeah, it's reversed. It wasn't blatantly obvious to start with. Um, yeah, great vocal performance, great harmony arrangements. Um, I love it really it's great I'll buy it all right well I appreciate your thoughts Ian thank you very much let me introduce the track the track is called This Is War by Jimmy Mowry Jimmy appreciate you sending that track in to Music Scene Investigation thanks so much we have one more track to listen to let's get to it this gentleman is track number three on today's MSI enjoy everyone certainly hope you do Scared of the world outside Feel like you're a runaway bride I'll turn back to the lies that betrays me I'll turn back to the vomit that's soiling me Feels like the worst kind of man Trying so hard, doing what I can Still incomplete, still incapable Pronouncing a quiet whispering breath I Oh, I i 
for not everyone see The turning point took place when I kneel There's nothing for me to do But say I'm staying in you That's track number three on today's music scene investigation. We're going to head over to Mr. Ian Blackwood first. Find out his thoughts. Ian, what do you think of track number three? Did he say vomit soiling? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that question Turn is popped up in the chat. back to the vomit soiling me. Yeah, I was... Yeah, um, not the... Not the best choice of lyrics. <laughs> um, and, I mean, I gotta tell you, like, <clears throat> nothing makes it harder to listen to a song with an extremely pitchy vocal um gosh i don't know if there's like a sounds like the, like it sounds like the song maybe came from a fellow that isn't english might not be a first language i don't know and i don't mean that in a negative way whatsoever and if someone wants to take a negative i'm i'm sorry i didn't mean that way I, it's uh, like maybe he's um he's like he, it sounds like there's an accent in there that he's trying to cover up or something um but um the snare was bad too. Uh, I mean, overall, it, yeah, yeah, it had a good effort. There was a moment at mi- uh, three minutes fifty seconds where he did this high thing that I was like, I actually thought was really cool. It was like kind of old, like um, mid nineties emo uh, bands like Captain Jazz and and Braid kind of did these things where they they had like a chanty emo sort of like out of kind of pitchy vocal that actually was cool. Uh, I don't know if that would be more of a a thing he should get into maybe noise noise rock um i mean there's the heart the heart's there you can tell because there's like a cool um there's a cool pace to the song and you know it's tight like the band itself seems tight and it seems like the the vocalist knows where he wants to go i just don't quite think he's hitting the mark with with his voice and uh, you know that's just me being horribly honest it's just that I, I i wrote pitchy then super pitchy then really pitchy so i you know, <laughs> it didn't really, Did um, yeah, it just didn't, yeah, it didn't get any better. I'm sorry. How pitchy was it? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> now, honesty is the best policy, and, and I yep. appreciate honesty in all its forms. Thank you, Ian. Now over to the other Ian, getting his thoughts as well. Ian? Yeah, well, the vocal was pitchy. I, after, I can't disagree. I mean, I think my remedy for this would be to change the key of the song. It sounds like he's, he's really struggling with going to some of the places he's trying to go. And I think if the song had a sort of overall lower key that he could sit in a bit better, he wouldn't be struggling so much. He does sound like he's straining in places. Um, you know, you can get away with doing this sort of style of vocal. I mean, there's a band called Elbow uh, over here in the UK. I don't know if you've heard of them over there. But uh, they sort of do this sort of whiny sort of gloomy happy stuff you know um and they do it very well in all fairness it's not really my bag but um you know (coughs) excuse me he was uh yeah he was pitchy and and he needs to work on that and also if you're going to do this sort of style of music uh you need to convince me and as a vocalist again i felt that he was concentrating on his performance and not really feeling the performance um, so he was trying too hard to get to the place he needed to be to convince me he actually felt what he was singing. Um, he, sounded worried. he sounded worried, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, It's something you see. Um, I produced a, a few vocalists in the time, and if a vocalist is unsure about what they're doing, they're not going to deliver the best take. Or if they're struggling to go to a place that you want them to go, they're not going to go with it all out because it's a psychological thing. As soon as they think they can't do it, they don't do it. Absolutely. And it sounds like this guy's in that, that head state. He knows he's struggling, and he's not giving it his all because he knows he's struggling. And even if, you know, he, he probably could hit some of those notes, but it's that psychological thing that's there that's stopping him from doing it. I mean, otherwise, I think, you know, things like uh, the acoustic tone was lovely. I really did like the sound of the acoustic. And the performance on the acoustic was really nice as well where it broke down sort of from the strumming to the picking. It was really solid. Uh, drums. Kick drum was far too much. Far too much bottom end boom. No clarity in that. Um, you know, it's a kick drum. It's not a, a 
boom drum. And, you know, <laughs> the kick's got a sort of more of a solid feel to it. And it, there was just no solidity to the, the, the kick at all. Uh, again, the snare, it just sounded like it was in a totally different room to the rest of the drum kit um, and the rest of the band. It sounded like, you know, the, the snare player was out in the car park or something like that. Um, <laughs> Uh, there is a song here. I mean, you know, yeah, the lyrics in places. I mean, in all fairness, we say they're a bit choosy, the lyrics, but they've got us all talking about them. And uh, that's a good thing, really. Um, I'm sting stinging you. Yeah, I mean, I think they need to take this back to the drawing board, drop the key, uh, work on getting that vocal tight and that performance nice. So, you know, we actually think he's singing what he's meant to be singing, what he's singing about. And uh, I think, you know, that's the start of something really cool here. All right. I appreciate it, Ian. Thank you very much. Over to Mr. Tom Chianti with his thoughts. Tom? Well, I never. I mean, this just proves the point that music is a very personal thing and uh, choices are made uh, that, that uh, will strike a chord with some people and not with others. Um, I agree, you know, with the pitchiness and... Um, as far as uh, one thing I, I loved about this mix was the TLC, the Tender Love and Care, they did give to the lead, which is allowing everybody to pick it apart. Out of all the songs, this had the most clarity and present lead uh, there. So you could hear his uh, subtle accent. You could hear the pitchiness. You could hear him getting it or not getting it. It, uh, the vocal production, whether you like the, the style, I think a lot of it had to do with the style. It reminded me of a, a little bit of a Tom Petty type of deal. And um, I, I get the type of sound they were going for for the drums. A very organic, live sounding, not tightly tuned, not really smacked, laid back playing and a very open sound. I get where this mix is coming from. Maybe that that's, you know, or I think I get where it's coming from. My main concern is that bass guitar could have been a little bit more there to help anchor and drive the song. Um, the lyrics, I gotta tell you, as, 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 as controversial as vomiting and soiling oneself may be, at least I could hear every word. And, and um, as opposed to the other songs, I could really hear almost all the lyrics clearly. <coughs> and at the end of the song, when they faded, I noticed that the balance between the vocal and the guitar was very consistent. And you could hear them at the same level on the way down. So this, this I thought, was a well-balanced mix. Whether you like the sounds or, uh, or the subject material... Um, is, is a personal choice. I think this is a very well-balanced mix. Um, Tom's a little, just a little bit over the top. Uh, I think they could have come back on that. But I get the style, I think, that they're going for and the feel they're going for. I like this song. I, um, does it need more work? Um, you know, I'm, I'm of the school. It's never done until somebody buys it, and then you have to get them to pay for the remix. So it's, it's, it's in that phase for me where it, it's almost there and um, maybe some mastering. Um, but again, you know, people may or may not like the pitchiness amount in the vocals. There's a lot of singers out there that go pitchy and it works. And for me, it didn't bother me, um, maybe because of the subtle way he was singing. The whole song's uh, sort of a uh, subtle pull back on, on and yet filled with energy and, and uh, emotion, I thought. All right. I appreciate your thoughts, Tom. Thank you very much. The name of that track is Staying in You by Nicholas Ogenval. Nicholas Ogenval, we appreciate your sending that track into Music Scene Investigation. Thank you so much. Now, gentlemen, uh, you've heard all three songs. It's now time to uh, put the ball over in your court uh, for the final seconds of the fourth quarter, so to say, as you decide on a song of the week. So I turn it over to you for discussion and your decisions. Ian, well, ladies first. Which Ian are you talking to? Ah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, uh, Tom, I'm, I'm interested um, in what you think. Do you think that last mix, the clarity was in it more because there was less instruments in comparison to the other tracks? Um, there was less, less going on, taking up more space, making it seem fuller. And the, I didn't make it seem sparse. It, it seemed full. And it also it sounded like to me like the guy did know... I mean, to, to me, again, the, the drums were weird, but I felt like as far as like high passing and, you know, losing lot, low end where you don't need it to, to get rid of mud, I feel like the guy, the engineer knew what he was doing. So that's cool. Um, yeah, no yeah. I, I, like I said, I, you know, until I heard your guys' uh, trepidations, you know, and naysaying and not, not liking it, I was going to say, well, this thing needs to do is go to a good mastering house. But <laughs> um, you guys brought up some points that didn't bother me. So obviously... You know, I am not the end all. Yeah. I may be the end, but I am not the end all. <laughs> um, I, again, for me, and I, and I um, track two just it just jumped. Like I, I was like tapping my foot, and like I stopped writing really about it. I just started really listening to it because it, it anchored me in, and that might just be because I'm younger and it's it's wrote me in. But I don't know. I, I really dug track two. I mean, for just overall, I, I feel like the band made it a good investment with whomever they recorded it with and decided. Um, you know, and I don't know if they went to a songwriter or if the band did it on their own, but um, I really think strong t- uh, song two is the strongest. I can't because believe you played the age younger. card. Say it again, Ian. <laughs> what did you say? I said I can't believe you played the age card. Well done. Was <laughs> <laughs> your? Well, I don't know. I don't want to come off like a dick. You know what I mean? Like, oh, who's that young idiot? But I guess I just paid well, myself. Well, nice the try, so. Ian. But I think you hit the dick mark. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. All right. Uh, so, Ian, uh, Mr. Blackwood, you select uh, song number two as your selection for song of the week? I think song number two is the strongest. Although the, the other two submissions were, were, you know, were, were cool and, you know, all the best to, to those artists. And I think they should never stop. You got to keep going. You got to keep trying always. But uh, yes, I thought song number two was the strongest. All right. Okay. Tom, Ian? Go on, Tom. Uh, okay. Uh, despite being old and in the way, <laughs> I, I, I actually, you know, when I consider things left and right and, and, and everything, um, number three may be a little too stylistic. It, it would definitely play well in coffee houses and live and, and folk festivals and whatnot, um, get lots of attention. But for overall appeal, I would have to agree with... Uh, the other Ian, and <laughs> and have to go with number two. Even though I still think that the reverse guitar in the beginning is is not necessary because I really like the acoustic sound. And yes, I also agree with Ian that all the artists are very strong. And um, no matter what we say, even though we're always right, they should <laughs> they should continue on. And and because these guys are well on their way, they all have a good grip and, and sense of what's going on. But I I too would go with number two. All right, Ian. Because over I'm Ian. old. <laughs> because you're old, of course. Ian. Oh, I said I'd buy it, and I don't think I would buy track number one or track number three. So I said I'd buy track number two. So that's got to be my track of the week. All right. Well, there you have it. Another unanimous decision by our panel. Jimmy Mowry, "This Is War" is the song of the week for this week. As always, thank you so much, and everyone in the audience, we'd love to hear what you think as well. I forgot to mention it before we selected it, but please let us know your thoughts in the uh, witness statement se- se- section. Uh, it's not a four-hour broadcast, Tom, but it sure seems like one sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> well, you know, it's when we sit around with good people, uh, time flies and we get extended, and, and we, there's just so much to talk about because this is our life. It is true, very true. But please, who we got next week? Please Richard? let us know about your thoughts in our witness statement area of the MusicScenInvestigation.com website. Next week we have joining us Ms. Deborah Russell. She is a business coach for musicians and artists, and uh, it'll be her second time with us on the broadcast. If you missed it the first time, go back and watch it so you know what to expect. By the way, her birthday is the day after next week's broadcast. So, Oh, we'll get Tom to sing then. Yeah, we will. It'll be great. No, you won't. No, you won't. <laughs> but I, I, I will take my shirt off. All right, you'll take oh, your shirt gosh. off. Excellent. 
And a big thank you to Mr. Ian Blackwood for joining us. Thank you so much, Ian. Uh, great time. Glad you were uh, able to hang out with us for a while. Oh, I appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me. And make sure everybody goes to limegreenstudio.ca to find out everything there is to know about Ian. Not thank- me. Him. <laughs> yeah. Ian Blackwood, of course. <laughs> yeah, but uh, thanks again, Ian. Ian and Tom. Thank you, everyone in the audience, for being with us. We're going to play out with This Is War by Jimmy Mowry on today's MSI. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you again this Wednesday for another Hit List. Bye. Adios. When you woke up this morning, tell me how did you feel? Do you like what you're seeing? When you look in the mirror Was it worth all the trouble? Are you afraid to come home? Yeah, we built it together Hope you like it alone Cause it's done, it's done, it's done, it's done, I'm done It's not alright, I'm not okay Yeah.